Well, good morning, everyone. If you would, please open up your Bibles to Psalm 95. If you're following along on our order of worship at home, then you know that our worship theme for this morning is uh, Sons of God. We're reflecting on what it means to be called children of God, both with respect to the love that God has for us and at times even the correction that he'll bring upon his people as an expression of that love. And uh, as we begin our time of, uh, I guess, worship or uh, preaching here this morning, with that in mind, I thought uh, that it'd be good to uh, begin with this reading from Psalm 95. He says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains also are his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the, the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of comfort here this morning, uh, that we belong to you, that this great creator of all things, the the maker of every good thing, um, knows us and cares for us. This is a tremendous comfort for us this morning as we continue to Uh, work through this pandemic as a nation, uh, to know that uh, we, your people, your church, are still known by you and loved by you, that we are cared for by you. Father, it's with this uh, care in mind that we also come to you today and pray for your blessing on the preaching of your word. Father, we know that you will not only deliver us from Uh, this time of trial, but that you will do so making your people stronger uh, than what they have been before. Uh, You bring this trial into our life for our good. And so we pray, Father, that as we begin now this morning with the preaching of your word, uh, to be taught from your word about how we are to live, we pray that you would feed your people, feed your flock, so that we may be strengthened by what we find here. We pray that you would do this, Father, so that we as a body might better represent you in this world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would please open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Our passage for this morning is 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 through 21. And I have to tell you, (laughs) it feels really good to say that. Uh, It's been about a month now since I've said that, since I've told you to open up your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians. And while I I appreciate uh, the time we've had to complete what I think has been a very necessary Sunday school class for the church, I've really missed our time here in 1 Corinthians. You see, as I'm moving through these books from week to week, I'm spending hours and hours reflecting on these passages. And in the process... I start to almost feel like I know these authors personally. That's sort of how I feel about Paul. Beginning with our exposition of Philippians, we've been in Paul's letters for about a a year and a half now. And by this point, Paul isn't just an apostle to me. He's my friend. And so I've actually been kind of missing Paul. It's not just that I've missed you guys over the past month. I've missed my good friend Paul as well. So it feels really good. Uh, to get back into the text and get reacquainted with my old friend here. I trust that many of you feel the same way. Once again, our passage uh, for this morning is 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 through 21. And in just a moment, uh, we'll read those verses together. But before we do that, I want to begin by reading a passage from the Old Testament. And that passage is Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. In it, David writes this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. I'd imagine that those are familiar words to many of you. Psalm 19 is a familiar passage. It's the kind of passage you might have learned as a child, as your parents or your Sunday school teachers try to teach you the value of God's Word. But I wonder, do you believe those words? Do you agree with what David is saying there? Already your conscience may be pricked. Already you may be thinking of those morning devotions that you keep intending to get around to but never seem to get around to. Already you may be thinking of how little you know of God's Word. And if so, that's fine, I guess. We'll get there eventually in our discussion of this passage. We'll talk about our neglect of God's Word and what it says about us as Christians. But that isn't really my point right now. When I ask you, do you believe these words? I'm not asking you if you have confidence in them. Meaning I'm not just asking if you believe them in the sense that you live out the implications of those words by actively seeking out the Word of God. Though, again, we'll get there eventually in our discussion of this morning's passage. Rather, what I mean is, do you think these words are factually true. Can you mentally affirm what David just wrote? And now before you go on and and rush out and give me the answer that you learned as a child in Sunday school, I want you to really think about what David is saying in this passage. We all know the answer we're supposed to give. We're supposed to say, of course, of course I believe those words. The Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. I believe the Bible. But I want you to think about what David is saying here. He's not just talking about whether the Bible is inspired by God. He's not just talking about whether it contains any errors. In short, he's not really discussing so much whether the Bible is the Word of God. Instead, he's talking about the benefits that flow out of this instruction. To be specific, he's talking about the commandments of God. And he's telling us about all the blessings that are experienced by those who keep these commandments. The law of the Lord revives the soul. It makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord rejoice the heart and enlighten the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, he says. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Do you believe that? you think that's true? Because I've got to tell you, if I'm being honest, there are moments when I have my doubts. Now, before you get ahead of me, I'm not saying I don't believe these words. I believe that what David says here is true. Rather, all I mean to say is that there are moments when it certainly doesn't feel like what David is saying here is true. I mean, have you ever actually tried doing (laughs) what's written in this book? It's not easy. It's actually very, very hard. And part of what makes it so hard is how little reward there seems to be in keeping it so much of the time. Much easier can it be to believe the words of Asaph in Psalm 73, where he writes, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? He declares, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. 
All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence for all day long. I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. I don't know about you, but that's a sentiment I can identify with. I try to order my life according to God's precepts. I try to live according to what's written in His Word. And then I look around me at those who are ignoring God's Word, at those who are perhaps even like the wicked in this psalm, setting their mouths against the heavens. They're openly mocking God. And they're prospering. I feel like I'm laboring and laboring to follow God with what seems like very little to show for it. And then they're ignoring God completely. And they're flourishing. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing. The heart in keeping them, there is great reward. No, no. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. That's a sentiment I can get on board with. Now, of course, Asaph goes on to tell us that he was actually in error when he thought this way. He goes on to agree with David in acknowledging that there is great reward in following God. In fact, he even pens this psalm to highlight the error in that thought, even beginning in verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So don't get me wrong. Asaph doesn't stay there. He doesn't remain in this frame of mind. But keep in mind, the reason he pens that psalm is because so much of the time, it really does seem like the wicked do prosper. It's a common experience among God's people, so common that God inspired Asaph to write these words to address that feeling. And this can make it very hard for one to remain faithful to God's word. When one feels that there's greater reward to be found in sin than in obedience. It's not uncommon when we feel this way, when we feel as if there's not reward in keeping God's word, when we feel as if there's greater reward to be found in the world and its system of wisdom to be tempted to compromise, to fudge just a little bit here and there in the keeping of God's precepts in order to adopt a more expedient means to our goals. How do you hold fast in the face of that kind of temptation? How do you remain faithful even when faithfulness seems less than expedient? When it seems costly even? This is a question that we've been exploring for the past several weeks in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians, you will recall, appear to be a church that's enamored with worldly philosophy. They've apparently written to Paul to ask him to sort out some questions they have about how to properly apply their faith in Christ. The only problem is that they don't actually esteem Paul's ministry very much. Though Paul helped found this church, there have been other teachers who have visited Corinth after him, even more gifted teachers, it would seem. And this has gotten the Corinthians to question some of Paul's methods. As you all know by now, it would seem that Paul adopted a rather plain style of teaching when he was in Corinth. And as the Corinthians compare Paul's ministry with the ministry of these other teachers, they're beginning to think that maybe the problem is that Paul doesn't really know what he's doing. Or perhaps he's not very skilled at what he's doing at the very least. And this is leading them to question Paul's instruction. So as Paul opens up this letter, he realizes that the very first thing he has to do before he can address the questions they've sent to him is reassert his authority over the church, which he does in part by defending his style of ministry. You can break Paul's defense down into three parts. First, he explains the theological basis for his ministry style. This occurs between chapter 1, verse 18 and the end of chapter 2. There we learn that Paul's rather plain ministry style was actually by design. It was intentional. Quite simply, the reason why Paul didn't speak with the kind of eloquence or or philosophical sophistication that the Corinthians preferred was because Paul understood that absolutely no one is saved through the sheer force of an argument. The gospel is a matter of spiritual wisdom, which must be discerned Spiritually, meaning no man, no matter how eloquent, can convince someone to become a Christian. Faith is a gift that comes only through the working of the Spirit of God. 
And not only this, but Paul also understood that the goal of salvation is worship. Sinners are redeemed to give praise and glory to God. Paul, it would seem, was incredibly cognizant of the fact that if he did come with clever or sophisticated speech, that certain people might be attracted to his message, thinking it an alternative system of philosophical wisdom. Basically, they'd become Christians for the social status they thought it would offer, not to become reconciled to God. And that would be contrary to to the purpose of the gospel. And so Paul adapted his method to be consistent with his intended outcome, which was the praise and adoration of God, not Paul or any other man. To quote chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul explains, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In the second part of his defense, Paul actually goes on offense as he explains the practical basis for his ministry style. This occurs in chapter 3, though I think you could say it starts as early as chapter 2, verse 5. There's some overlap between these two parts. In that section, he explains that there was actually another reason why his message wasn't sophisticated. It wasn't only because he understood that a person might be tempted to believe on account of the packaging of his message instead of its content or because of the social status that the content might bring to his audience instead of the pardon it offers them. No, it was also because Paul understood that the Corinthians in particular were susceptible to that kind of error. Essentially, Paul tells the Corinthians, actually, the problem wasn't me. It was you. You were still too immature for me to get into the more advanced stuff. If I had tried, it would have hindered your progress in the faith, not advanced it. Paul even tells them that actually from what he's hearing, they're still too immature. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? He asks in chapter 3, verse 3. This was ultimately one of the Corinthians' problems. They were still too much like the world in their thinking. Their minds were not yet sufficiently transformed by the foundational realities of the gospel to be made ready spiritually for the more advanced doctrines of the faith. In the third part of his defense, which has been our subject for this now our third week, Paul concludes his argument by challenging and reinterpreting the Corinthians' perception, not only of him, but even of his associates and his fellow teachers. He begins in verses 1 through 7 by presenting them with a picture of how they ought to view their teachers, and that's as stewards, as mysteries of uh, God, not as theological innovators. That's apparently how the Corinthians interpreted the differences between a guy like Paul in his plain style of ministry and Apollos in his more eloquent style. They saw them as theological innovators who each offered their own kind of spin on Christianity. And then, of course, they used these differences to boast over one another according to whoever school of Christianity they thought to be the best. Paul tells them, don't do that. (laughs) That's not what we are. None of us are attempting to add on to Christ's teaching. We are stewards. Our job is to take what Christ has entrusted to us and merely deliver it to you. From there, Paul moves on to a second image in verses 8 through 13, and that's of a spectacle. It wasn't just that the Corinthians thought themselves superior to one another. Many of them even thought themselves superior to Paul. And one of the reasons for this, it would seem, is because of the greater position and status they enjoyed in the world than Paul. Paul suffered for his faith. They didn't. Again, they thought that discrepancy was Paul's fault. Paul very sarcastically informs them that actually it's your fault. He reminds them that that rejection is actually, uh, or that his rejection is actually a normative experience for the Christian, and that if a person is actually accepted by the world, then it's more likely due to their immaturity as a Christian than it is due to any particular skill set they might have, which could make the gospel more appealing in the world's sight. So this is the second way that Paul wants them to view 
him and his ministry. And they are to view him as a spectacle to be marveled at before the world. Third and finally, Paul reminds them of the position that he actually enjoys before them. And that's as their father in the faith. That's what we're going to explore in greater detail here this morning. Paul's position as the Corinthians' father in the faith and what that means about how they should relate to his ministry. If you recall, I said that in this section we find a a way of navigating the pressure we so often feel from the world as we reinterpret our own role according to these images. This is, of course, part of the force of these three images that Paul offers here. I've said that if the Corinthians are going to put away this worldly thinking that's causing them to trip over Paul's teaching and render them unequipped to receive this more advanced doctrine he has to offer them, then it's not only that they must learn to view Paul through this framework, it's that they also must learn to see themselves in the same way. They, too, are stewards who don't have the option to in any way alter the Word of God in order to make it more appealing to the world. They, too, are are a spectacle, not to be accepted by the world, but to be mocked and marveled over. And it's no different with today's image. If the Corinthians are ever going to grow out of this worldly thinking that is inhibiting their growth in Christ, then they must not only see themselves as a steward, And as a spectacle, they must also see themselves as a son. This is partly how you will learn to resist the temptation to compromise in the face of the world's apparent prosperity. You will see yourself as a son. So what does this mean to see oneself as a son? Let's go ahead and read what Paul says here and find out. Paul follows up the sarcastic rebuke of verses 8 through 13 with these words in verses 14 through 21. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out the talk of these arrogant people. Or he says, uh, rather, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Once again, what does it mean to see oneself as a son, according to this passage? I think we could distill it down into into two main points. But before we get there, I'd like to take a moment first to define the parent-child relationship, according to the Scripture. I actually want to spend an entire week on this point, defining the parent-child relationship according to the Scripture, and then we'll come back and look at these two expressions of sonship that we find in this passage next week. But first, let's look at this parent-child relationship according to the Scripture. The Bible, of course, is, is sometimes hard to understand, and part of the reason... Uh, it can be so very hard to understand, is because it's working in a different framework than what we're accustomed to. That framework can be historical or cultural, meaning it's referencing either historical events or cultural practices that we're not familiar with, so when we read it, it can feel very foreign to us. Or there are parts that, that fail to land with the sort of force that one might expect from a particular passage. Sometimes, though, that framework is theological. Meaning sometimes the problem is that our mind has become so darkened by sin that there are concepts which the Bible at times assumes, either about God or about the world that he's made, which are no longer a part of our way of thinking. And so because we don't understand the design of God's creation, we fail to pick up on some of the more subtle implications of a passage 
with it, which an author is assuming when they write. I think that's partly what's happening here. Paul says some things here that can come off as, as rather offensive. He assumes a kind of authority over the Corinthians and demands a kind of respect from the Corinthians that many people could interpret as some sort of power trip. And that's not what's going on here, but I think that's how we can be prone to interpret it. And the reason we're prone to interpret it like that is because we don't have a sufficiently biblical view of parenting. We tend to get our view of parenting from our parents, and that's because our parents are our earliest models of parenthood. They're the first uh, to expose us to this idea. And so what they believe in practice often serves as our baseline for what we think parenting should be. And of course, that can be a problem because even the most dedicated parents are still imperfect models at best. So very often our view of parenting has been distorted in one way or another by the example that's been set for us. This is uh, particularly true for those who've grown up under especially poor or even sinful parents. Uh, Paul is going to tap into an image here that's going to feel especially repugnant if that's been your experience of parenting. So before we address Paul's imagery here, I want to first stretch your understanding of parenting itself. Because I think if you can understand what parenting is from God's perspective, then you can understand the heart and the impact with which Paul delivers this exhortation. So once again, in this passage, Paul says, this is actually how you should view me, and that's as your father. It starts as early as verse 14, where he says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. The expression then becomes more explicit in verse 15. There Paul says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In short, he tells them, You need to remember, Corinthians, I'm your dad. And then based on that image, he exhorts them, verse 16, I urge you then, meaning, remember, I'm your dad, and because I'm your dad, verse 16, be imitators of me. He then goes on in verses 17 through 21, not just to exhort them to follow his instruction, but to even really demand their obedience. He doesn't just say, imitate me. He actually demands their imitation and even threatens punishment on them if they do not imitate his example. And just so you know, for those of you who have been following through chapters 1 through 3, what Paul is saying here is that the style of ministry that he's described back in those chapters, again, it's not optional. He's telling them, you must think in the same way. You must do it how I do it. If not in form, then at least in philosophy. You must abandon the pride that's causing you to make distinctions among yourselves. You must abandon this sectarianism within the church built around these personality cults. And if you do not, then I'm going to come and discipline you. This is the proverbial equivalent to your mother yelling, don't make me come up there, while you quarrel with your big sister upstairs, or your dad declaring, don't make me turn this car around as you fight with your little brother in the back seat. <laughs> this is... I mean, almost quite literally what Paul says in verses 18 to 21. He says, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I'll come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I'll find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with, a lo or with love in a spirit of gentleness? <laughs> That's Paul asking the Corinthians, listen, do you need a spanking? You can almost picture him pulling off his belt by the end of verse 21. And I'd imagine that that may rub some of you the wrong way. If so, the reason is probably because either you've had parents that were poor examples, and so when Paul says, I'm your dad, therefore imitate me, you're thinking, what's the relationship there? What does imitation have to do with a father-son relationship? I never want to imitate my parents Either that or you've had parents who disciplined you sinfully. Perhaps in anger, for instance, or even for selfish reasons. And so you hear Paul threaten the rod here, and that's what flashes into your mind, and it's repulsive. You think to yourself, 
Who is Paul to tell me what to do? And you think that because your parents expressed a form of unjust discipline that provoked you to question their authority. So what's going on here? How should we view this relationship between a father and a son? And how might it transform the way we see this exhortation from Paul to, quote, be imitators of me? I think there are two ways that we can look at this. The Bible, of course, often exhorts children to obey the authority of their parents. And if we're trying to understand why, I think it it can be summarized in two points. First, the Bible demands this obedience because it assumes a basic level of love and care in the parent-child relationship. And so it assumes that when the parents are giving instructions to their children, when they're training their children, they're doing it for the benefit of their children. I think of the fifth commandment, for instance, honor your father and mother, which Paul notes in Ephesians 6, is the first command with a promise that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. There's this expectation that the child is going to flourish under their parents' instruction because their parent is instructing them for their benefit. And this is true even of the discipline that a parent inflicts on a child. To quote Proverbs 15.5, A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. And this is true even of the unbeliever, by the way, biblically speaking. I think of of Luke 11, uh, 11 to 13, for instance, where Jesus observes, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? There's this, this baseline assumption that parents care for their children in the scriptures. And so when they give them commands and instruct them, they do so for their benefit. Now, of course, this isn't always how it works out. Parents often will discipline to get their children to comply with their own selfish desires, or they'll issue it alongside poor counsel or advice. But that's the design. That's how it's supposed to work. This is then one reason why Paul might say, remember that I'm your dad, so do what I do. He could be saying it because he's reminding the Corinthians of the affection and care he has for them, and he's doing this to remind them that if they follow what he does, then they'll flourish. You can almost think of it like a father coaching his son on how to ride a bicycle. He's showing them, you know, put your foot here, like this, and then pedal fast like this. Watch me, because if the sun follows their example, then they'll stay upright instead of crashing. Paul might be evoking that concept as he encourages the Corinthians to follow his example. But I tell you, honestly, I don't think that's the main thrust here. You see, there's another reason why the Bible exhorts children to follow their parents' example, which is much more theological in nature. You might even say doxological in nature. Doxology, in case you aren't aware, comes from the Greek word doxa, which means glory, and logos, which means word or saying. So a doxology is a word or saying of glory, meaning it ascribes glory to something. And what I'm trying to say is that biblically speaking, there is a doxological element, meaning there's an element that gives praise or glory to God, in this parent-child, father-son relationship. What is that element? Well, it has to do with this idea of imaging. You're familiar, of course, with Genesis 1.26, where God determines to create man, saying, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the... uh, um, a livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You may be probably very familiar with that passage. What you may be less familiar with is Genesis 5, 1 through 3, which says this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. 
It would seem that God actually expects children to resemble their parents much in the same way that he expected Adam to resemble him. I think you even see this principle play itself out in the physical resemblance that a child shares with their parents. That's by God's design. Now, I'm not going to try to expound on why God has put this design element in the creation, this idea of resemblance between parent and child. It would only be somewhat speculative if I did try to do that. I would have to extrapolate out a couple of theological foundations to get there. But I think I can say definitively how this design is supposed to work. I think you saw it unfolded in the passage I just read to you from Genesis 5. God creates Adam in his image. Adam has a son in his image. If that's the case, and it's all working like it's supposed to, then who is that son supposed to look like? Who is Seth supposed to look like? I mean, Adam, yes, but also God, right? Adam images God, and so as Seth images Adam, who is he also imaging? And the answer is God. Biblically speaking, this is how parenting is supposed to work. It's the parent teaching the child. This is what it looks like to image God. In fact, going back to the fifth commandment, you know that that part about living long in the land? That's actually tied to this concept. I remember very uh, many years ago, uh, my grandpa told me that this verse often puzzled him. And the reason he said it puzzled him was because my grandmother, his wife, died at a, at a relatively young age uh, of 65. And he didn't understand that because he said, uh, you know, because I, I never knew anyone who honored their parents the way she did. What my grandfather didn't understand, what I didn't understand at the time, is that this promise has to do with the blessings and the curses that were promised under the law. God told Israel that if they obeyed the commands of given through Moses, commands which expressed God's righteous character, mind you. He said that if they obeyed these commands, then they would flourish in the land he was giving them as he dwelled among them. And if they disobeyed, then they'd actually be evicted. They'd be overcome by outsiders and spit out of the land. In other words, when he says, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land, the Lord your God is giving you. He's presuming that the parents are living obediently to his law and then they're communicating that obedience to their children. Essentially, it's assuming that they're doing what Moses commanded in Deuteronomy 6 when he says in verses 1 and 2, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land which you're going over to possess it that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. And then again in verses 6 through 9, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, or when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, this is what parents are supposed to do. I'm not saying that this is always how it does work. But this is how it's supposed to work. Biblically speaking, parenting is the process by which one generation communicates to the next. This is what this means to be an image of God. You do what I do. I think we lose sight of this element to parenting today. We live in a day and age where many parents think that the goal of parenting is to simply help the child, quote, grow into their own person. This really isn't biblical. Don't get me wrong, a child is to grow into their own person in the sense that they're supposed to eventually leave their parents' home and form their own independent families, and a good parent will parent their child with an eye towards that goal. But that being said, this doesn't entail simply empowering the child to find their own way in the world, their own outlook on life, their own way of doing things. If you stop and think about it, that's really a very postmodern outlook to parenting. It's one that says that there is no right and wrong way to do things, no right and wrong way to live. And so you just learn to do what makes you happy. Biblically speaking, that's false. False. 
Because there is one God who created man to image him. And this means that there actually is a right and wrong way to live. There is a right and wrong way to do things. And the right way of doing things is to be pursued by all people. The parent's job is to communicate that right way of doing things to their children. Again, that doesn't mean that the child takes the exact same form as their parent. Just as a child shares a physical resemblance to their parents while still having some of their own unique features, so also we can expect that they'll express their imaging of God in a unique fashion. You know, a child mustn't necessarily become a plumber, for instance, if their father is a plumber. Because plumbing is not a necessary component to functioning as an image bearer of God. But what it does mean is that they will share their parents' philosophy, their outlook on life. The parent is supposed to communicate that outlook to the child because, again, presumably that outlook is biblical. It's a representation of God's outlook. And so it is really the only right way of doing things. And in this sense... The parent's example is not just good advice. It's not just a suggestion. It's a command. It's an obligation for the child to live up to. There's a sense in which the parent really should say to the child, and again, to be clear here, I'm talking on a a macro level when I say this, but they really should say to the child, no, actually, you don't get to do it your way. You watch me and you do it my way because what I'm showing you right now is what it looks like to function as an image of God. And they should do this even to the degree that they will discipline and correct the child if they will not conform to this image, just as you see Paul doing here in verses 18 through 21. If you notice, this is the kind of perspective that Paul takes in his relationship with the Corinthians. Not only does he tell them to imitate his example, even as he himself follows Christ, as he'll do in chapter 11, verse 1. But if you notice right here, the implication of this idea is that there is really only one right way to do things. Look again at verses 16 and 17. He urges them to be imitators of himself in verse 16. And then in verse 17, he continues saying that this is why he sent them his beloved child, Timothy, quote, to remind you of my ways in Christ. There you see the dynamic, right, of Paul's patterning of his own life after the image of Christ and then setting that before the Corinthians as a a pattern for them to follow as well. And then he continues, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Again, there's one way. And it's to be practiced universally in every church. Again, there isn't Paul's way of doing things, in Apollos' way, in Peter's way. There's only one way, and that's God's way. And Paul and Apollos and Peter are only expressing their unique ministries within that single framework. Listen, if we don't understand this concept of parenting, this concept which says, this is what it means to image God so you do what I do, then I think that we lose some of the logic And even the force of what Paul is saying in this passage. When he says in verses 15 and 16, Though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus in the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Paul is telling them, your obligation, your obligation as my children is to follow me. Do you understand? He's pulling rank. It's like the father riding home with his son after baseball practice and saying to him, look, I don't care what your coach told you. I'm your father. You listen to what I say. Or it's the mom telling the daughter, I know that's what your teacher might have said at school, but in this household, we operate like this. He's not just appealing to his love or care for the Corinthians. He's appealing to the authority he has over them and their obligation to imitate his example. At the beginning of this morning's message, I asked you if you believe the words written by David in Psalm 19. I said there are moments when it doesn't seem as if there's great benefit in keeping God's word. Moments when it can seem as if it's more expedient to follow the world in its wisdom 
than to follow what's written in the Word of God. I also said that this passage can help you hold fast in the face of that sort of temptation, that it can help you to remain faithful even when faithfulness seems costly. How does it do that? Well, it does it by reminding you what you are. And that's a son or or a daughter, if you will. That's true in terms of your relationship with God, of course. When you believed in Christ, you were adopted into God's family, and this means that you now have the obligation to bear a resemblance to your heavenly Father. It's just like Peter exhorts us in 1 Peter 1, 14-16, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We have not just been purchased by God through the death of Christ, but we have been born again by the Spirit of God. And this means that as children, we have an obligation to bear resemblance to Him. This is a resemblance, of course, that often isn't going to be accepted by the world as a whole because it's presently under the rule of Satan and tends to be shaped after his image. As John points out in 1 John 3, 1 and 2, he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. So we can expect the rejection. We can expect some measure of discomfort to accompany our imitation of God, meaning it won't always pay off, but but there's benefit in, Whether there's benefit in the imitation or not, the obligation remains. As children of God, we must resemble our Father. This concept can be helpful in that sense, to remember that as children of God, we simply don't have the option of not imitating Him. We must do it, whether there's benefit in the imitation or not. However, if you think about it, that's really not the point that Paul is making in this passage. He's not telling the Corinthians, God is your father, right? He's telling them, I am. He's saying, I'm your spiritual papa, so you listen to what I say, you imitate my example. And this is the element that I really want to dive into in greater detail next week as we talk about how sonship is expressed. But what Paul is pointing to here is his authority, his example before the Corinthians. He's pointing to their obligation to imitate him. That's not an obligation that's partly born from the fact that Paul was, uh, or rather that is an obligation that's partly born from the fact that Paul was the first to share the gospel with them. Uh, But I think you can extend it logically to us as well by virtue of his apostleship. We can't forget this point. There's a sense in which we are all spiritual children of the apostles. The church is built on the foundation of their witness. They are the ones who took what was first received from Christ and then delivered it to us. And do you understand what what I mean there? Our understanding of Christ is a mediated kind of knowledge. We haven't learned from Christ firsthand. We've never met him personally, at least not in the sense that we normally mean that. He didn't write any books. Everything that we know about him is mediated through the testimony of the apostles who Christ himself commissioned to communicate his teaching and example to the world. So if we're going to learn to imitate God, it first begins by learning to imitate the apostles. They are our fathers in the faith. The faith that we've received was first delivered by them. I think this is worth pondering for a moment. It's worth reflecting over how this should affect the way we interact with the apostles and whether our interaction with them really is what it should be. So we're going to come back and spend some time thinking about this idea next week. We'll discuss how this concept of sonship and and sonship with respect to the apostles specifically should affect the way we interact with the world and its wisdom. However, before we get there, I want to prepare you for that message by having you consider just what it is that we've been called to imitate. In case you haven't caught it yet, the key word for this morning's message is imitation. Imitation. 
I'm focusing on this statement in verses 15 and 16 where Paul says, For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. What's Paul driving at in that statement? Was he wanting them to imitate? I think this is worth considering before we start talking about how we're supposed to interact with the apostles in this father-son relationship. So what's the answer? I think there are three basic answers we could arrive at, and they look both backward and forward in this letter. This is really a transitional statement, uh, this, this passage, where Paul is summarizing what he's already said, while at the same time laying the groundwork for what he's about to say. That makes sense, because again, Paul realizes he can't address the questions the Corinthians have written him about without first addressing their perception of his ministry. So first, looking backwards, Paul is telling us that we must learn to imitate his approach to ministry. Again, uh, the point of contention through these first few chapters has been Paul's approach to ministry. The Corinthians think him unsophisticated and unskilled. They think both his message rather quaint uh, in his in its uh, communication and its content. They're interested in something that's a little more appealing to their cultural sensibilities. Paul tells them, actually, I very intentionally didn't communicate the gospel like that. First, the adoption of such methods would only serve to produce false converts. And second, because you weren't yet ready spiritually for the sophistication that I did have to offer. Now, Paul tells them, and by the way, I don't care what your coach says. I'm your father. You listen to me and you imitate my example. He pulls rank in order to tell them, in no uncertain terms, my approach to ministry is the one you need to imitate. The way I'm thinking about these matters is the way that you need to think about these matters. This is important because it reminds us that we have an obligation to follow the example that Paul sets for us in chapters 1 through 3. Earlier this week, I was reading a book on church planting. And the author really goes to great lengths to sanctify his lack of use of Scripture in his approach to church planting. He's very careful to point out, for instance, that description is not prescription in the Bible, meaning just because the Bible says something did happen in a certain way in the book of Acts doesn't mean it's telling us that it must happen the same way in the modern church. And on the whole, I agree with that principle. I don't think there's any significant problems with that principle, but then he used that principle as license to go on and argue for the use of secular secular business practices in the building of the church. And the problem is that many of these same business practices that he would advocate for are the exact opposite of how Paul says he conducted himself in his ministry. And this man could try to answer, well, you know, description isn't prescription, except Paul says right here, my description is is prescription in this instance. You do what I do here. Be imitators of me. We need to keep this in mind as as we may be tempted to adopt uh, secular practices in the administration and building of the church. We are obligated to imitate Paul's example in the approach to ministry that we've been studying together over the past several months. We don't have a choice. We are sons. Second, looking forward, Paul is telling us that we must learn to imitate the example that he's about to set for us in the rest of this letter. Again, the Corinthians have written Paul with this set of questions, and it appears that they don't entirely trust his counsel at this point. They're ready to just write it off and say, well, that's just Paul's way. I follow Apollos. Paul spent the first part of this letter deconstructing that line of thinking so he could tell them, actually, no, it doesn't work that way. You have one father, and you need to do things my way. He's been building up to this statement in verse 17 where he says that he sent them, Timothy, to remind them of his ways in Christ, quote, as I teach them everywhere in every church. That all pertains to what we're about to encounter in this letter. Paul is is going to say some things that are going to seem strange. You know, like today's message on the biblical understanding of parenting, he's going to say some things that may seem counterintuitive to our normal experience of the world and what seems, quote, normal. 
what we need to understand up front is that we're not in a position to challenge Paul on these assertions. We don't get to tell Paul, well, I guess I just disagree. No, we don't get that right. We don't have that kind of authority. We are sons. We have an obligation to follow the example that he's about to set for us. Third and finally, looking backwards once again, Paul is telling us that we must learn to imitate his example of suffering. That's the immediate context, which sets the stage for the statement in verses 14 and through 16. In verses 8 through 13, we learn that the Corinthians apparently thought themselves a bit better than Paul because they didn't share in the kind of rejection that he so often experienced from the world. It seems they, they might have thought him poor at his job, that the reason why he suffered was because he wasn't as sophisticated as them in their engagement with the world. Paul first mocks this idea in verses 8 through 13. And then he says in verses 14 through 16, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. No, you imitate me. Basically, he takes their arrogance and he says, I'm sorry, do you even remember how you came to know the gospel? You got it from me, not the other way around. I'm the teacher in this relationship, not you. You learn from me. And in context, he does this in order to communicate to them suffering actually is part of the example that I'm trying to impart to you. You're supposed to suffer like I do. You read the rest of Paul's letters and it quickly becomes apparent that he understood that suffering was an integral part of the pattern that Christ has imparted to us. It's not just some sort of fluke in Paul's ministry that he happened to suffer, an unhappy coincidence. No, it's part of the design. If we're to follow Paul as he follows Christ and image Christ along with him, then this is an integral part of the design. We suffer with him. This is obviously incredibly significant to consider as we think about our interaction with the world and its wisdom. Again, the world not only rejects the message that Paul was so insistent on communicating in chapters 1 through 3, but it also rejects the priorities and the lifestyle that he's about to communicate in verses or chapters 5 through 16. And so there's not always benefit to living according to this design. There are going to be moments when it feels like it's more trouble than it's worth. What do we do when that happens? And we're tempted to abandon this kind of instruction for something that seems a bit more profitable. We remember that we're sons. We remember that suffering is part of the design. So again, that's the example that Paul is setting for us here this morning. That's what he's calling us to imitate. The question now is, how ought we to interact with that example? Essentially, how is sonship expressed biblically? And how ought it transform the way we interact with the ministry of apostles like Paul? I think there's still quite a bit to explore here. And so we'll come back and take a look at the answer to that question in part two of this message next week. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we close here this morning, uh, pondering uh, the example that Paul has set for us, uh, we realize how much help we need uh, to follow in his footsteps. And that's because, again, uh, very often as we uh, walk in Paul's footsteps, we're met with suffering, we're met with rejection. Uh, his ways uh, that he learned from Christ are not popular. Uh, and, and this is because Christ himself was rejected by the world. The world does not accept you. It doesn't accept your son. It's certainly not going to accept his apostles. And so if we walk in, in this pattern, we understand that it's going to be very, very hard for us at times. It's not going to feel profitable. It's not going to feel rewarding. It's going to feel very difficult and painful. As we consider that today, we pray for your grace to help us to heed the, the instruction that's been handed down to us from our fathers. We pray, Father, as we get ready for our message next week and think about how sonship is expressed, we pray that you would prepare our hearts so that we could indeed live as sons. And we pray that you would work in this way in us so that we could imitate your example, so that we could function as your image in this world. 
and that you might be glorified through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.